Striker, Black Striker! Many Americans are aware of George Washington's ownership of enslaved individuals at his Mount Vernon estate. However, it's less widely known that it was actually his wife, Martha, who significantly expanded the enslaved population there. At the time of their marriage in 1759, George likely owned around 18 enslaved individuals, whereas Martha, slaveholding parents typically gave their daughters more enslaved people than land. White women were active and violent participants in the slave market. They bought, sold, managed, and sought the return of enslaved people, in whom they had a vested economic interest. Owning a large number of enslaved people made a woman a better marriage prospect. Once married, white women fought in courts to preserve their legal ownership over enslaved people and often won, according to the book named They Were Her Property, written by Jones. Rogers, for them, slavery was their freedom. White women from wealthy plantation-owning families in the antebellum South sometimes abused black slaves, especially black men. This abuse often took the form of sexual exploitation and mistreatment. The power dynamics were heavily skewed in favor of white women, who used their authority to engage in sexual relationships with enslaved men. These relationships were often non-consensual and reinforced both racism and sexism. Slavery stained America for over four centuries. In that time, it warped generations of people, both free and enslaved. It created a distorted psychology of white supremacy. White Americans dominated the nation and built a violent, oppressive system to control African Americans. Lynchings, beatings, and cruelty tormented black communities. Even without outright violence, segregation pervaded society. Housing, schools, jobs, and the justice system all discriminated against black citizens. Racism infiltrated every aspect of American life. White families reaped huge privileges and benefits from this racial hierarchy. In the antebellum South, married white women had no political rights. Husbands ruled as head of the household while wives were relegated to the domestic sphere. Women were treated as their husband's property. Their freedom and mobility were drastically limited. They could not even travel without a male chaperone. Abuse was considered normal for controlling wives. They were expected to remain cheerful, obedient, and faithful, no matter their husband's affairs or abuse. White women knew their husbands fathered mixed-race children with enslaved women. This is why many white women sought their own power, and slavery provided that outlet. Most know George Washington kept slaves at Mount Vernon, but few realize his wife Martha caused the slave population there to balloon. When they wed in 1759, George owned about 18 slaves, while Martha owned 84. Though unusual in scale, Martha exemplified white women's routine and active role in slavery. Owning slaves boosted a woman's status in finding a husband. After marriage, white women fought in court to maintain legal control of their slaves, often successfully. For these women, slavery equaled freedom. Martha Washington's vast slave holdings were unusual, but her participation in slavery was not. White women were active, often violent actors in the slave trade. Owning slaves boosted a woman's status and marriage prospects. After the wedding, white women fought to maintain legal control of their enslaved people, frequently winning in court. For these women, slavery equaled liberty. Historians once dismissed white women's role, relying on a few Southern diaries. But historian Stephanie Jones Rogers used a different source, interviews with formerly enslaved people. These narratives came from the Federal Writers Project, part of the Works Progress Administration. They reveal the truth. White girls were raised to be slave mistresses. From infancy, they learned to dominate. One narrator recalled, other people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. They would sleep on the floor, here, there. Just like a lot of uh, wild people, we didn't, we didn't know anything, didn't all look in no book. Young white girls observed their mothers, grandmothers, and female cousins disciplining the enslaved. They learned they would one day possess human property, and the measure of a good marriage was a husband who allowed his wife power over her slaves. Girls were groomed to manage slaves and sustain white supremacy. Once of age, white women relished dictating enslaved people's lives. They were free to verbally and physically abuse their servants. Southern households aimed to recreate slave systems on the cheap. White children observed their mothers dominating black servants. 
From girlhood, they internalized these behaviors. The book They Were Her Property details this upbringing. It describes Lisiana Burwell, age three, demanding her father cut off a slave's ears and buy her a new maid from Clarksville. Her father gave Burwell more slaves as gifts, property to do with as she pleased. The book shows how antebellum white women actively owned slaves and laid claim to human beings as capital. The law of coverture held married women as legal non-entities. Their identities were subsumed under husband's authority. As historian Stephanie McCurry shows, this mirrored how white slaveholders exercised control over the enslaved. Women had stunted legal and political standing and faced backlash when trying to expand their rights. Yet Jones Rogers explains coverture's limits in the South. White families transferred property to daughters, separating it from marital assets. Southern women drew up prenuptial agreements and legal documents, granting them sole control over present and future property. When husbands mismanaged money, Louisiana wives petitioned for separate marital estates. In other words, two systems coexisted, patriarchy alongside white women's real financial and legal leverage. The myth of white women as sheltered homebodies is false. Merchants, officials, travelers, and the enslaved all documented white women's presence in antebellum slave markets. White women routinely sold and purchased black people, circulating slaves through social networks. White women's influence spawned the market for enslaved wet nurses. Some felt endless childbearing made them slaves to their own homes. Purchasing nurses lightened their labor. Depending on means, white women hired, borrowed, or bought wet nurses, freeing time for social events. The enslaved suffered grievously under some white women who grew violently abusive. Husbands had to restrain their wives' cruelty toward slaves. Some white women forced enslaved people to reproduce, enriching mistresses with more human property. Records detail Henrietta Butler, raped repeatedly, to bear children for her mistress. She nursed her rapist's wife's infants a common plight. Masters assaulted enslaved women to supply wet nurses. Affluent white widows often ran brothels exploiting both male and female slaves. By 1860, nearly half of all enslaved Africans in the Americas labored in the United States. Four to six million souls. Census data shows 393,873 whites owned 3,250, 528 black people. A mere 1.5% of white Americans owned slaves. Slavery's official end in 1865 did not conclude the trauma. The failure of Reconstruction crushed hopes for equality in the 1880s, 90s. White supremacist beliefs surged. As the Civil War raged, white women resisted emancipation. Loyal to the Confederacy, they sought compensation for freed slaves. Some spirited enslaved people away Way to unaffected areas, a tactic called refugeeing. After the war, white women negotiated exploitative contracts with freed blacks. They took black children as unpaid apprentices, maintaining control. Though better than outright slavery, apprenticeship denied true freedom. Black families worked for former masters at pitiful wages. The system replicated slavery under a new name. W.E.B. Du Bois, an American sociologist, wrote something about it. He said, a slave went free, stood for a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again toward slavery. This brief moment in the sun was when black communities, along with support from the Freedmen's Bureau, started establishing schools, social assistance, and some legal protections. However, this progress was largely undermined by the white Southern elite that includes white women. They swiftly passed laws known as the Black Codes. Southern whites sought to recreate slavery in all but name. They passed the Black Codes denying black voting, jury service, and militias, reimposing control. White men and women enacted laws entrapping freed people. Vagrancy and contract laws led to peonage, a debt-based servitude. By 1915, at least six former slave states had passed laws allowing forced black labor. Vagrancy alone could land blacks in the convict lease system, working against their will. This brought huge profits to white women and men who traded black bodies and labor. A 1929 interview features Rebecca Felton, 
a prominent white Southern woman and former slave owner. She describes mingling with presidents and holding leadership roles at national exhibitions. In her memoir, Felton exposed rampant corruption in Georgia's legal system. Judges elected by white factions sentenced black people to years of hard labor for petty crimes like stealing eggs. The convict leasing system generated huge profits for white elites. Felton knew the courts were designed to criminalize and re-enslave blacks after emancipation. Violence empowered this corrupt system. The Ku Klux Klan terrorized and murdered murdered black Americans, along with sympathetic whites. The related women's KKK gave racist women an empowered femininity. The original KKK formed in Pulaski, Tennessee after the Civil War. Angry about black rights, white men created a secret vigilante group and ritualized violence. White women supported their efforts sewing costumes and representing virtuous womanhood needing protection. A later incarnation welcomed white Protestant women directly through the WKKK, founded in Arkansas in 1923. This highly structured group mimicked Catholicism with ranks like imperial commander and rituals mirroring church services. United by racism, nationalism, and protecting white families, women joined in droves. Though less violent than men, their respectability made them powerful advocates for white supremacy. They led boycotts, protests, and charity efforts that normalized the Klan. While the WKKK claimed to empower women, its racism betrayed them, privileging whiteness over gender. It subjugated women to male leadership. Still, many members considered it both a social club and a route to influence. Their willingness to terrorize for status revealed white women's complicity in sustaining systematic oppression. Historians downplay the WKKK, seeing them as ancillary to racist men since they rarely participated in lynchings or violence. But make no mistake, the women's KKK exerted real power. As savvy manipulators, they exploited their social position to advance white supremacist agendas. Many were already organized in social clubs, weaponizing gossip and reputation destruction against those they opposed. The WKKKK worked to remove Catholic teachers from public schools and boycott businesses. They supported racist politicians and boosted their influence through charity efforts like food baskets for white families coordinating weddings, speeches, and parades, they normalized the Klan as a social institution. To members, the WKKKK was a wholesome club boosting their status, but its innocuous appearance smoothed the Klan's insidious infusion into everyday American society. White Protestants saw joining as a natural alignment of their values and traditions, not something radical. Yet this club culture relied on a shared commitment to racism and xenophobia. Some leaders were promised prominent community figures like Lulu Markwell, the first national WKKK head, and Daisy Douglas Barr, a preacher. Their authority amplified the group's reach and impact. This reveals white women's complicity in sustaining systemic oppression, even if not openly violent. While the WKKK claimed to empower women, it ultimately subjugated them to white male dominance in the name of racial solidarity. But white supremacy could not uplift white women. Still, Many saw the group as their route to influence. Their willingness to terrorize others for personal gain showcased white women's role in perpetuating injustice, a far cry from innocence. 